Okay, we're moving on to chapter four. Um, this chapter is all about yarns and sewing threads. Um, you did a great job with the exam, so um, I will go through and I will make sure to grade the questions that were automatically graded by the computer. Um, those tend to have some errors, so um, I will get to those once all of the exams have been completed. So great job with chapter one, two, and three. I will warn you that is the easiest of the uh, exams that are coming up, um, but it's amazing. You know, you know, you guys did a great job. Um, really important information that continues on throughout the rest of the semester. So now we're moving on again to yarns and sewing thread. So the process of making yarns um, predates recorded history. We have been making clothing um, for centuries, and the process of making yarns in order to weave it or knit it into clothing. Um, essentially it's always stayed the same. So um, it was a major milestone in the history of civilization. So again, when we talk about the production of textiles, it really is really important to um, the development of different civilizations and countries. Um, the process again has remained virtually unchanged throughout the ages and it stays the same today. So we're going to talk about yarns and we're going to talk about sewing threads at the end of the chapter. So yarns are super important. They are different than sewing thread. Um, we'll talk about sewing thread because it's a very specific item and when it comes to textiles. Um, yarns are a very broad category of a um, essentially a group of fibers that have been twisted together. So when you look here at the definition, yarns are a group of fibers twisted together that form one continuous strand. You can think about this picture down here in the bottom right. This is a spinning wheel. Um, you may have seen it in the classic Disney movie. Uh, I think it's yeah, Sleeping Beauty because she pricks her finger on the spindle of the spinning wheel. Um, we don't use spindles nowadays in mass production, but we use the same idea. We, we take that idea of drawing up a bunch of fiber and pulling it taut and twisting it simultaneously in order to create these yarns. So like we said, it, it predates, you know, recorded history. It stayed the same. We're doing it in the same process. Spinning is that process. Spinning is the process of twisting fibers while simultaneously drawing or pulling it out. Um, if you go into the uh, video section, you will find um, some great videos. Um, one of them is on producing yarn and one of them is on producing sewing thread. And you'll see that drawing out or drawing up process where, again, you take a giant mass of fibers that are just hanging out. They're all exposed and free. And then, again, with that process of pooling, twisting, um, you get this nice yarn shape. Simple process. Uh, we're going to break yarns down. We're going to talk about yarns um, in regards to their uh, uh, the process in order to make them. So we're going to talk about spun yarns, and then we're going to talk about filament yarns. These are the two main categories of yarns. Now, spun yarns are composed of relatively short lengths of fibers twisted or spun so that they hold together. Staple fibers make up spun yarn. So when I say, you know, it's composed of relatively short lengths, remember when we talk about staple fiber lengths, those are shorter fibers. They're measured with inches. They're never going to be miles long. The longest length that you'll ever have is maybe 20-ish inches, you know, a couple feet long. And that's a really long staple fiber. Um, we can't go, we can't measure it in yards. We can't measure it anything greater than essentially inches. Um, that's what works. So... When we talk about spun yarns, they are made out of primarily staple fibers, so the shorter fibers. Twist is necessary to hold these together. If you don't twist them together, it's just going to fall apart. And again, when you watch the videos and you see how someone spins and you draw you draw out that yarn or draw out the fiber to make the yarn, it's, it's pretty magical how it works. Again, imagine taking your hair. You go and you get a haircut. You get a trim. You're going to ask the barber or the uh, um, hair, hairdresser, can you please just trim off a half an inch off of my hair? So you don't want them to take off a lot, not a whole inch, take off a half. Now that's about the staple length of cotton. That's about, you know, average cotton length. Half an inch of hair. Think about, they chop it off, it falls on the floor of the salon, they sweep it up into a ball, and now you have this, you know, a dustpan full of these short little fibers. They're human hair fibers, they're about a half an inch long, and you got a pile of them. Those fibers can be made easily into a yarn simply by twisting 
and drawing out little sections at a time. And it's the twist that holds it together and gives it strength. So as crazy as it might seem, but you getting your hair trimmed and using that bunch of, you know, trimmed off hair could essentially make yarn. It won't make a lot of yarn, but that's that idea is that that then can make yarn and it can eventually make miles of yarn depending on how many fibers you have. And that yarn can be used to hold something together with lots of strength. So when it comes to these spun yarns, you absolutely have to have the twist in order to give it strength. When it comes to filament yarns, these are composed of continuous strands of fibers that can be miles long. So remember back to the video that we watched at the beginning of the semester when the woman was making um, that high-tech fiber slash yarn um, in the facility and we watched the fiber melt out and kind of pour out of the two spinneret heads and a big pile of it fell on the floor. She got rid of that waste and then she started to you know, grab the, the whole entire strand of fibers that were falling out of the spinneret and she slightly twisted them in her hands and then she essentially set it up through the machine so the machine could finish the spinning process. And that was a entire spinneret of fibers, filament fibers, we'll call them polyester, so we'll just say that it's polyester, some type of a polymer. Um, those polyester fibers that were pouring out of the spinneret those were instantly taken to a yarn state because the machine went through the process of spinning it. Now, if you were to just pull out one of those filament fibers, so one of the strands coming out of the spinneret head, it would have a good amount of strength to it already. It's made out of essentially a giant piece of plastic. They're pretty strong. Um, so when it comes to the filament yarns, because filament fiber yarns are of infinite length, they don't need to be highly twisted. Most filament yarns are really low twist, just enough to hold them together. So it's not giving any necessary strength to the filament. It is, it is adding additional strength, but it's not needed. You don't need to have a ton of twist in order to make it strong. They're strong on their own. We simply do a slight twist to them so that we can hold it together. And they are very strong, these filament yarns. Um, it's easy to identify spun versus filament um, when you go to untwist them. So one of your assignments that you will have for chapter four is a swatch kit assignment where you're given a specific list of yarns to use. Some of them are going to be difficult and, you know, I'm sorry, but you have to do it in order to see how fine some of these yarns are. Some of these yarns are going to be teeny tiny and they're made up of even tinier fibers. So again, some of them are going to be a little difficult, but this swatch kit assignment, you are going to untwist yarns and you're going to tell you know, tells all about the yarns that you're untwisting. Spun yarns, when the yarn is untwisted so that the fibers are parallel, the yarn will come apart easily when pulled on without breaking. So what that means is when you take a spun, let's say you take something like cotton. So if you take swatch number one, which is denim, it's 100% cotton. You can take a yarn from either the long side, so from here, which we call the warp yarns, we'll talk about that a little later. Or you could take one from across the, the swatch, which we call these the weft yarns or the filling yarns. You can take one from either side. If you take it from one side, it's going to be blue. If you take it from the other side, it's going to be beige or white. Um, either one of those yarns is made up of little tiny staple cotton fibers. So they're both spun yarns. I know that because they're made out of cotton. I know that cotton doesn't come at filament length. I know that it only comes in staple length so that it has to be spun and twisted tightly in order to give it strength. So I know it's a spun yarn. So when you go and you pull off a blue yarn or, or white or beige yarn, either one, you're going to realize that as you untwist it, you can kind of pull it apart fairly easily. It kind of falls apart like paper does almost because you're taking out the shorter fil um, fibers and you're able to separate them. Now, if you go to a swatch that's made out of something like polyester, and if you go, it's 100% polyester, doesn't matter whether you pull out a filament, I mean, a, a, a filling yarn or a warp yarn or a weft or a warp, doesn't matter what yarn you pull out. When you go to untwist it and make the fibers parallel, the yarn does not come apart and the fibers remain parallel in your fingers. You're going to have a really hard time pulling out an individual fiber from that yarn because they're all the same length. Nothing is broken, nothing is separated, everything's still kind of stuck between your fingers. So when you're trying to untwist a filament, you'll notice that, well there's not a lot of twist to it first of all, and they're all the same length. 
because again, when we think about filament yarn and filament fiber, miles long, feet, yards, really long naturally. So when they cut that little piece of fabric out for you to put it in your swatch kit, it's, it's all going to be the same length. There's no break in the fiber there. Okay. Um, spun yards can consist of both natural and manufactured because filaments can be chopped. You can take a filament yarn, you can take polyester, and you can chop it up into a million little pieces, and you can turn it into a staple fiber. So we can mix. We can take polyester, cut polyester, staple polyester, and we can mix it with cotton. We can get a cotton poly blend, and we can take those yarns and we can spin them together and make it into a spun yarn made up primarily of staple fibers, even though some of them are natural and some of them are manufactured. We cannot, so filament yarns can only consist of manufactured fibers or silk because we can't make staple fibers longer, natural, natural fibers. We can't make cotton miles long. We can't make flax miles long. We can't make jute or ramey or hemp. We can't do that. We can't make, you know, wool or, you know, a sheep's hair. We can't make it miles long. It naturally is shorter. So filament yarns can only consist of manufactured fibers because they come out of a spinneret or silk, because again, remember, silk is that one natural fiber that is, what, 1,600 feet, 1,600 um, yards long naturally. So silk's the only natural fiber that can become a filament yarn. Okay, some other random categories that we're gonna implement here where we're gonna break down that idea of yarn into either a spun yarn or a filament yarn. And then we're gonna break it down even further and we're gonna say, is it a single or is it a ply? Now when we say it's a single, we're talking about a single strand of yarn that's made up of twisted fibers. So if you look down here at this picture, there's actually none of them down here that are any, of, none of these are single plies. Um, they're all multiple plies. So none of these are single. This one yarn right here, this one white would be considered a single. Um, but all of these are made up of plies down here at the bottom. So if you look at the picture, and you know what I could do too, let's go and let's look up um, yarn. And we can look up like a, let's look up bulky. And let's look at images. And let's see if we can get, so this is a, this is a, um, this is more like roving. That is a really, oh, actually that's, looks like material, acrylic bulk thick. Oh, that one almost looks like it's not even yarns. Here we go. This is like roving. Again, they're calling this a chunky acrylic yarn. Um, but this is a very, very thick, um, slightly twisted acrylic. So it is more similar to roving, but we're just going to call this a yarn for now um, for the sake of this. Um, this is a gigantic ball and this is one single yarn. So the yarn is just made up of a bunch of fibers twisted together, but this is a single yarn. Now this is different than if you're looking at something like this one here, where you can kind of see, I mean, it's hard to tell, but it looks like it's like a twisted rope. This is more of what this double ply looks like here. So this two ply, where you can tell that they're twisted together. So a single would be like that gigantic olive green colored yarn, where it's just one strand of yarn twisted. That's it. That's called a single. When it comes to plies, you can have two or more of those single yarns twisted together. This becomes more expensive because there's not only more material, but more time. So you have to twist another yarn and then you have to twist them together. So I like to use the example of something like a red vine or a Twizzler. Um, a Twizzler, I think, is the one actually that it's, uh, where it's like three plies. So again, I'm gonna exit out of here again real quick. And then we're gonna look up, I think it's a Twizzler. Twizzler, Twizzler, Twizzlers. Pull and fill, yep, Twizzlers. So a Twizzler is kind of that idea of plied yarns, where Here's a yarn, we'll, we'll, we'll call this Twizzler. This one Twizzler is like having a single yarn, but it's made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine smaller Twizzlers. So this would be like a nine plied yarn. So think of Twizzlers, think of, oh, it's one, one strand, but it's made up of nine other pieces. So that's kind of that idea of, you know, um, plies when it comes to yarns. You can have two plies, you can have three, 
four, five, et cetera, et cetera. You can have a bunch. The, the more you have, though, the more it's going to cost. Again, not only is it more material, because now we have one, two, three, four. Wow, now we have four yarns. But we also have all the time it took to spin those four yarns individually, and then the time that it took to spin the four yarns around each other. So all more time consuming, thus being more expensive, not to mention more resources. We will also talk about the fact that when you're twisting yarns, they can be twisted in different directions. We're going to talk about an S twist and a Z twist. They don't really mean a whole lot to the way that it looks, but it's something that we will talk about in... Oh... That's it. I'm going to talk about it right now. That's why. There will be a question on your um, assignment that's going to ask you about the, the Z and the S twist. So, what that means is that all yarns have to be twisted. You have to give a little bit of twist to the yarn in order for it to hold together, whether it be a spun yarn or a filament yarn. Now, after it's twisted, it's going to look a certain way. If you look at this picture, this is what we would consider an S-twist, because if you run your kind of cursor or your finger around the shape, oh, it's kind of shaped like an S. It, it starts like an S and it wraps around like an S versus this one over here, which is the opposite, it's shaped like a Z. So it's got that diagonal from the top right down to the bottom left, shaped like a Z. So you will be asked, is this an S twist or is this a Z twist for the yarns that you will be using for your assignment? It has nothing to do with how it looks or how it works. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality or the aesthetics. It is just simply a way of identifying the yarn. That's it. So if you look here at these images, this one, oh, this one falls down like a Z, like a Z. All of these are Z twist. Where over here, I can see that this is actually an S twist in this larger, larger yarn. Ooh, but within each, so this is made up of two, it's two plies. These two smaller yarns are actually made up of Z's. So these are a Z twist and a Z twist, but twisted the opposite direction into an S twist when it became plied. I know that probably all sounds crazy and all for naught, but it is important. This is how they're going to write it on a spec sheet. So remember we talked about spec sheets, um, those specification sheets before? This is important. They're going to tell you on that spec sheet, I want a five-plied yarn with individual yarns with a Z-twist, and I want the five-ply to be an S-twist. So these are things that you, know, you need to know what that means. Why do we ply it? Well, what's, what's the point? It's because it can hold a thinner yarn more firmly. So if you have a thinner, weaker yarn and you want it to be firmer and stronger, you can add on to it. Do multiple of that same thinner yarn. Um, mix, you know, you can even, you can add a yarn to it. So more twist is added, which adds more strength. Weaker spots in spun yarns are reinforced when you ply them. Um, we kind of talked about that um, earlier on how you know, when you have a, um, a spun yarn, it's made up of staple fibers. And when you look at a staple fiber, it's, you know, um, they're short, they're not all the same. So when you twist them, it's not all going to be very consistent. It's not going to be all the same width or all the same diameter. So when you spin it and, and make it into plies, you're going to reinforce those areas that are a little bit thinner naturally. For spun yarns, it makes them stronger makes them more uniform in diameter, and it reduces their tendency to pill. So because you're plying them, wrapping more around each other, and giving it more twist, you're making it less likely for fibers to escape the yarn and just kind of hang out on the surface and get bunched together, you know, with that little bit of static electricity, and to form pills. So you're making it less likely for that to happen. You're reducing the tendency for it to pill when you ply the yarn. A cord, a cord isn't even thicker. So when you think about it, if you've ever made um, anything with paracord, uh, maybe you made a bracelet or a belt or, you know, backpack straps. Um, it, they're made, you know, specifically for things like um, backpacking, mountain climbing, hiking, all these things, because you can use it as a uh, as a resource later on if you need it for safety. So when you Make something from cord. That cord is two or more plied yarns twisted together. So you're getting a very thick, very thick um, yarn structure. So let's look up and go. Might as well do it while we're here. Let's look up cording. So um, let's look at paracord.
Okay, so. So when you look at this, let's see if you have a see one that's kind of spread out. Okay, so again, this is something called paracord. So it's made up of multiple strands. It is a cord. It has an exterior layer, but it's made of a multiple yarns that are plied already. So these are two plied yarns. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two plied yarns twisted together to make a cord. So when you think of cording, so let's just look up cording. When you think of cording, it is multiple, something like this, where you have multiple strands within a single yarn and then you wrap them around each other. So you have multiple yarns plied and then you take those plied yarns and you wrap them around each other, which makes this really strong and typically very dense cord. Okay, so that's an important one. Cords are even stronger. Now novelty yarns, novelty yarns are unique. Novelty yarns are oftentimes called fancy yarns. Um, not of all uniform thickness. They have intentional irregularities on their surfaces like bumps and knots and curls and slubs and ribbon and knots and everything you can imagine. They're made to be fun. Novelty yarns are not made for strength. They're not made for comfort. They are made for an aesthetic purpose. They're made to look fun. Okay, so you are going to have a question about novelty yarns on your homework that will be due next Sunday. So you want to make sure that you understand that novelty yarns, they're not comfortable, they're not made for quality, they are made for aesthetics, they're not made to hold up, they're not abrasion resistant, um, they tend to be itchy. So uh, make sure that, you know, you understand what novelty yarns are, novelty, novelty yarns are and what they're used for. Um, you'd find them oftentimes in scarves and maybe like a cute novelty little hand, you know, bag or little um, clutch or maybe you'd find it in a headband or a hat, but not in pajamas, not in evening wear, not in children's wear, not in newborn clothing, because again, they're not made to hold up to abrasion, they're not comfortable, they're there for looks, they're cute. Okay. Uh, mono, multi, and microfilaments. These are a subsection of filament yarns. So monofilaments, you can kind of think of these as um, a yarn composed of one single filament. Again, think about that idea of the spinneret. Think about the video that we watched at the very beginning of the semester where all of those fibers are falling out of a spinneret head, hundreds of fibers. They're all very long they're all very strong on their own. But again, the woman that's working in the laboratory, she spins them and gets them ready. She prepares them for the yarn. Now imagine just taking one of those fibers, that fiber on its own, if you were to use that fiber on its own, and if you were to use it and weave it into fabric, let's say, that would be considered what's called a monofilament. Mono meaning one, one filament made into its own yarn. Okay, so we're going to just spin it a little bit, put a tiny bit of a twist in it just for strength, and we're going to utilize it as a yarn. It doesn't happen very typically when it comes to apparel, but again, I'm going to eggs and out again because these are nice when you get a visual. But if you think about, if you think about monofilament when it comes to, oh, so weird, I don't understand what these toe pictures are. Uh, Fishing line is what I'm trying to, let's see. Let's just look up fishing line. Fishing line is a great example of monofilament. Okay, so when you go and you buy some fishing line, it's gonna look something like this. We're gonna have one, essentially, you know, thick strand or thick fiber of plastic and you use it to go fishing. There you go, right? And that's an extreme example because it's they're, they're thick and they're meant to be very, very thick. Um, you can think about, you know, nylon as a monofilament. They make them in different weights. They make them, you know, you know, fairly thin. So here are some examples of some loose monofilaments. Um, it doesn't have to be very, very thick like a uh, fishing line, but you, that's the, the idea. That's the concept. Okay. Monofilament, one. Multifilament, meaning a yarn composed of many filaments. That, again, goes back to that first video when she in the laboratory took those fibers falling out of the spinneret and spun them into a yarn. That's a multifilament made up of filaments, many filaments. Here's a question. So here, again, I know that this chapter gets confusing and it gets a little overwhelming at times. 
But here's something to boggle the mind. If a monofilament yarn, so if a single yarn and a multifilament yarn have the same diameter, so if they're equally as thick, so imagine holding essentially, like think about a straw. You've got a straw shape or straw size of a single monofilament yarn, and then you have a straw shape and size of a multifilament yarn. You have them in your hands, you're looking at them. Which one's less flexible? And you have to think about it. Okay, if the, if the straw in my left hand is made up of a single yarn, how much flexibility is within that? Versus the straw in my right hand, which is made up of multi, many filament yarns that have been twisted together, which one's going to have more movement to it? Here's a good example of it right here. The monofilament yarn of a given diameter is going to be stiffer and less flexible than the multifilament yarn of the same diameter. So the one in your left hand that's made up of one piece of plastic essentially because that's what filaments are. They're made out of, they're manufactured, they're essentially plastic. Some of them are cellulosic too, but let's just say they're made out of chemicals. So that one piece of one single yarn, that is going to be much more stiff than a yarn of the same diameter, same size in your hand that's made up of multiple little or smaller filaments. And you can kind of see that here, like, oh, okay, so ooh, imagine if it was one giant fat, you know, piece of plastic versus, oh, multiple smaller ones. There's going to be more movement in the smaller ones. So a monofilament, especially in regards to something like fishing line, it's thick, it's stiff, it's not flex. It's, I mean, it's got some movement to it, but it's not going to be lofty like we could use in um, apparel. So keep that in mind. So a monofilament, especially if it's thicker or denser, um, it's not going to be very flexible. Then there are these things called microfilaments, and it's what it sounds like, mono one, multi-many, and a micro tiny, microscopic. Microfilaments are fibers that are able to be manufactured in a diameter that is finer than silk. So remember we talked about microfibers in the last um, chapter? This is that same idea, microfilaments. This is essentially really the only way that we can make microfibers. Um, they're fine fibers. We call them microfibers because they're finer than their natural size anyways. It's all dependent on the size of the spinner at whole. And again, we have to alter the chemical solution that is, you know, that the fibers are made up of. Um, we have to alter that a little bit in order to make them able to go through such a small opening. Um, we also refer to them as micro denier. And we'll talk about the word denier in a little bit. But um, the name applies to both the fibers and the yarn. So when we say microfibers, we also mean, you know, microfilament, we're also talking about the yarn. So microfilament, microfibers, it all kind of means it's a very, very, very small, small version of that synthetic. So whether that be the fiber itself or the yarn that it's being twisted into. Okay, so a finer version of that, smaller diameter. Uh, microfibers can be used in filament form or they can be cut into staple fibers and then spun. Again, you're gonna you're you're gonna lose some of the benefits if you cut up any type of a filament, uh, but you can do so. It can be done. Microfibers made from, or I'm sorry, fabrics made from microfiber filaments are soft and drapeable, and they're hard to distinguish from silk. So when you have a microfiber filament, again, it's actually being made smaller than the diameter of silk naturally. So it's hard to tell. It's going to be very soft, very drapeable. If you then cut it into staple length and then spin it, it's not going to have those same characteristics. So again, there's pros and cons to doing it. There are reasons why you may want to, but typically we keep those microfibers when they're filaments. You know, we keep them filament length. We keep them long. When staple length microfilaments are blended with cotton, wool, or other fibers, the resulting yarns and fabrics are softer, more flexible, more drapeable, and more fluid. So this is a great example of why we would cut down those microfiber filaments and why we would make them into a staple length. We would cut them down and we make them into a staple length so that they can be blended with cotton, which is a staple fiber, blended with wool, which is a staple fiber. If we leave them along and in their filament form, we're going to have a really hard time wrapping a, a mile long length filament, microfilament, with these little tiny spun fibers. It's just going to be very difficult to do. So this is a reason why we would cut those microfibers up into little staple lengths and then we would blend them to make that natural cotton or the natural wool into a softer, more flexible, more drapeable, more fluid fabric.
Okay, so there are reasons why. Okay, spun and filament yarn properties. Three important properties of comparison between spun and filament yarns. We're going to talk about the difference between the two. We're going to talk about the yarn uniformity, yarn smoothness and luster, and then the yarn strength. So, kind of easy to think about which is better. I'm going to tell you right now, it's always filament. <laughs> filament yarns are more uniform, they're smoother, more lustrous, and they're stronger. Okay, if you look down at the bottom here, you see a picture of what's called a bulked continuous filament yarn, a, BF, a BCF. This just means that this is a filament yarn made up of filament fibers that have been slightly twisted together to, to form a continuous strand. Okay, they're very uniform, so you can see, oh yeah, it's the same size and shape around the entire yarn. It doesn't vary in its diameter. There's no weak points in these. It's very smooth. So because it's all very uniform, it makes a very smooth shape, which then causes more luster because the smoother the surface, the more luster, the more uh, reflection of light. And it's very strong because there are no weak points. This is a very strong yarn. Okay. Now this filament yarn compared to the spun yarn, not very uniform, not as smooth, not as strong. So filament yarn always wins. And again, that's why we have gone to so much, you know, manufactured fiber and yarn production because it's better in some regards. Now this is mainly talking about strength here and uniformity. Um, so fi filaments will win in that regards. But cotton or natural or wool or many of the natural fibers, they beat manufactured fibers in a bunch of different other categories. So there are again, pros and cons to all fibers, all yarns, everything. Okay, so we, again, that's why we need to know what the end product is going to be and why we're using it. Okay, so uniformity, not uniform in diameter over the entire length. So if you see here, ooh, kind of thinner here, but thicker here. Uh, a little bit thinner here, but again, thicker here. So not uniform all over. Smoothness, not so smooth because there's all this fuzz. Because again, there's shorter little fibers being twisted together. So here, this one's kind of slipping away because it's too short. This one's falling out. This one's a little frayed over here. And that's just always going to happen with spun yarns. When they're little and they're short, you have a really hard time encasing them all in that twist. So we're, we're, we're spinning them as much as we can. We're, we're giving them a good, nice twist, but we can't catch all of that fuzz. They're going to have a naturally fuzzy surface. Not as strong as filament yarns because there are these weak points. There are these points where it's thinner in some areas, where pieces are exposed. It's just not as strong. The more uniform, the stronger. Now, what are the uses of spun and filament yarns? Fabrics can be made of all spun, all filament, or a combination of the two. You can use them however you want, really. You just have to think about the end product. Spun yarns provide warmth, softness, and a lightness of weight. Things like blankets and t-shirts and sweaters are great to be made from spun yarn. They can be fuzzy and it doesn't matter. They don't have to be super strong. You're not, you know, you're not going to lift a human being with your sweater. Filament yarns provide smoothness and luster and a uniform appearance as well as that strength. So lining fabric, ski jackets, rope, cording, um, hammock material, upholstery material, things where you're going to want strength. Filament yarns made from filament fibers are often the better choice. Okay. Now we're going to talk about yarn twist. This is very important. This relates to your uh, homework that you have tonight. So you are going to be asked questions um, about, and I'm sorry, um, I've lost my screen. Okay. I'm sorry, here we go. Um, you're going to have a, a, a question on the TPI, which is turns per inch. So you're going to have to use your magnifying glass um, this week when you do your homework assignment. The reason why you're going to need to use it is because you're going to need to remove, again, you're going to remove either one of those weft yarns from the side of the fabric or a filling yarn from the top of the fabric. And you're going to put it underneath the magnifying glass and you're going to count how many turns per inch and our magnifying glass is a nice one inch square so that's the amount of twists in one inch of yarn turns per inch affects the appearance and durability of both the yarn and the fabric 
Spun yarns with a low TPI, about 2 to 12, are called soft twist yarns. They're softer and flexible. Spun yarns with a higher TPI, 20 to 30 twists per inch, are called a hard twist, and they're strong and firm. You can even over twist a spun yarn and get a TPI of anywhere from 30 to 50 or, you know, 40 to 50. And those give us a pebbly, um, almost like a puckered um, appearance. And you can get something like crepe fabric utilizing an over twist. So when you're spinning a yarn, when it's considered a spun yarn, it's made up of staple fibers, so shorter lengths. You can have a soft twist spun yarn or you can have a hard twist spun yarn and the TPI corresponds. So again, on the assignment, it's going to ask you if it's a low, medium, or high twist and you're just going to count. You're going to, it's going to be kind of difficult. You're going to, you're going to use a magnifying glass and you're going to zoom up with your eyes and you're going to count them. How many twists per inch are there in the yarns that you're given? Now when it comes to filament yarns, they usually have a very low twist. Anywhere from a half a twist to per a half a twist per half per inch to one twist per inch. So again, you are going to be assigned some filament yarns uh, made up of filament fibers. When you go to take the yarn off of whether again it be the weft side or the filling side, when you go to take a yarn off, you might notice that oh, there doesn't seem to be but a half a twist to this, and you are probably correct. Half a twist is not an uncommon thing to do for a filament yarn. A single twist is common as well. Again, the more we twist the filament, it's a little bit unnecessary. You may want to over twist it for something like a crepe yarn where you're going to tightly twist it to create this almost like a pebbling effect or like a puckering of the yarn. Think about twisting your hair and your fingers. The more you twist your hair and your finger, the more it's going to get drawn up and it's going to get um, kind of bunched up into a ball. We can do that to yarn, and we can do it purposefully, again, in order to get a certain appearance. Twist and filament yarn does not increase the strength. It simply holds the filaments together. Okay, filaments are sometimes tightly twisted, there we go, or over-twisted to produce surface interest like crepe yarns. The Swatch 23 is an example of crepe. Um, it has a pebbly or harsh surface, so you can feel it. Again, while you're sitting here watching this video, while you're doing your homework, take your hair, if you can, in your in your finger and just twist and twist and twist and twist and then overly twist it and you'll see that it gets shorter and it gets drawn up and it becomes like a little ball um, like almost like a little knot because of the extra heavy overly twisting of your hair that is something that sometimes is you know desirable okay back to that twist direction it means nothing it's essentially there just as a way to um, kind of identify the direction it's just it's just a um, Something that we do for aesthetics, but it's really something that's going to be put on a spec sheet. An S and a Z twist. As S twist runs upward to the left, similar to the, sh to the shape of an S, um, the letter. A Z twist runs upward to the right, similar to the diagonal part of the Z, I mean the, the Z, um, the letter Z itself. Not an element of quality as it does not affect strength or abrasion, affects aesthetics only. And when it comes to the twist, um, it's an, it's even more important for aesthetics when you have a yarn that is plied and they're different colors or when you're creating a very simple geometric design in the fabric like something like houndstooth, um, chevron, something like that where it's a very simple diagonal line um, pattern. This aids in that. Okay, so nothing to do with quality, simply to do with the way that it looks and it really is somewhat difficult to see um, and it doesn't make a huge difference to the appearance anyways just the direction of that spin okay we're gonna talk about carded and combed yarns so these are specific to cottons linens and wools again you're gonna have we kind of skipped a little bit of check uh, section of the textbook but we're gonna move into this carded and combed yarns um, because we're gonna talk specifically about certain types of yarns so all staple fibers are carded. But carding is essentially just getting those fibers that were a crazy mess, just, you know, pulled off of the plant, pulled, shaved, you know, sheared off of the um, animal, and they're just put into a bag. Taking those yarns or taking those fibers and making them into yarns would be very difficult to do straight away. Straight from the sheep to yarn will be hard. So what we do to all staple fibers is we card them. It's a cleaning process. It's essentially we brush them. So you imagine taking a brush out of your dresser and you brush the yarns. 
It helps to clean them, straighten them, and untangle the fibers. Now, every single staple fiber goes through the carding process. But not every staple fiber goes through the combing process. So for finer fabrics, the carded fibers then go through a secondary process of combing. The combing unit further cleans the fibers and parallels them. Combing also helps to remove short fibers. This again, think about having a comb. Have a, think about having like a, what we call a fine tooth comb. So, you know, someone, that's a, that's a, you know, a saying, I'm going to go through this, you know, exam with a fine tooth comb. So brushing your hair takes out some of the knots. It, it helps to tame your hair when you brush it. But if you imagine then after brushing your hair, you take a fine tooth comb and you comb your hair, your hair is going to be far less tangled. It's going to be much smoother, much flatter, much softer, much finer. It's really going to help your hair to lay flatter. This is that same idea, but in regards to fibers, all fibers have to be carded. They all have to get a brush. They got to get somewhat cleaned up so that they're easier to work with. But not all fibers are combed. Not all fibers go through this extra process. Combing's not always desirable in all fabrics. Something like denim or flannel or terry cloth, those type of things, we want that extra kind of um, fluffiness to it. We want that extra um, kind of, you know, I mean, it's a little bit more tangled, a little bit more messy, but it's desirable. Just like sometimes you tease your hair because you want it to be more tangled. You want to be able to put it up in a ponytail. You want to be able to make buns or whatever it is that you're going to do. So having super, 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 super combed fibers is not always the best. Just depends on the end product. Okay. Okay. So here's some terminology related to that combing and carding process. So we're again, we're only talking right now about cotton, linen, and wool. So we're talking about cotton, flax, and wool. Okay. These terms relate to only these fiber types. So when you take carded cotton, so when you take cotton fibers and you brush them, we call that sliver. When you then take that sliver, so you take that carded cotton and you take a fine tooth comb to it and you comb it, that combed cotton is called combed sliver. Kind of makes sense. The only thing you really have to remember is sliver. Now with linen, linen is made up from the flax plant, when you take the flax plant you break it up, make it into fibers. You have those fibers and you card them. So you take a brush to them and you straighten them out. We call that toe. Okay. That one, I don't know how to help you remember these weird ones, but think about toe. That's the knot. That's just the carded linen or the carded flax. Now, when you comb that toe, so it goes through, it goes through the second stage of now fine tooth comb, combing it, it's called line. I like to think of top of the line. So I think of like the better stuff is the line. Okay, so that's the combed linen, we call that line. Now when it comes to wool, the carded wool is called sliver, similar to the carded cotton. So those names are interchangeable in the terminology. So that's kind of easy because us, ah, sliver means that it's the not best cotton and the not best wool. It means that it's been, you know, carded but hasn't been combed yet. Then when you think of combed wool, which again is that combed sliver, it goes through the next process, we call that top. And hey, I think again, up top of the line, that's the best, okay? So I use that little top of the line cheat for linen and I use it for wool. Sliver is both the carded cotton and carded wool. And then, you know, combed sliver, that's kind of easy because you're just combing sliver. So you're going to the second process for sliver. The only one that's kind of confusing is, is the linen toe. So that one, I don't know how to help you remember that. But carded linen is called toe. These will come up on your exams. Not all of them, but some of them will. So. It's, these are just kind of memorization. It's hard to not, um, it's hard to make them, you know, relatable in any other way. Okay, blends and mixtures. This is really important too. Again, I'm going to use a ton of analogies. I'm going to try and make this as easy as possible for you to remember that, you know, I use Twizzlers, I use Red Mines, I use uh, extension cords. I'm trying to make this as relatable as possible. I'm going to do the same thing right now for blends and mixtures. A blended yarn is made up of two or more fiber types. Blending is usually done to combine the desirable properties of the fibers. 
We talked about this before. We talked about this in the last chapter questions. Why, why sometimes would we use blended yarns or blended fibers instead of just using one? Well, the reason why we would blend sometimes is because we don't have all the desirable characteristics from one single fiber. Man, I love the fact that cotton is absorbent. I love that it's um, comfortable. I love that it's, you know, stronger when wet. Ooh, but I would really like to have it be... Um, have really good wicking ability and cotton doesn't necessarily necessarily have really good outstanding wicking ability so I'm gonna mix some olefin with it that's a blend because I want it to be able to wick I want it to be able to absorb that moisture and move it to the surface so that it it gets it cools off even faster okay so that would be an example of why you would blend because I can't get everything from the one fiber I gotta blend it with something else again used to combine the desirable properties of both the fibers or multiple fibers when fiber blend is in a uniform manner, we refer to that as what we call an intimate blend. When it's like a 50-50 mix, we call that an intimate blend. Think about a relationship. It's intimate, it's 50-50. Everyone puts in equal amounts, okay? So we call that intimate blend when it's equal amounts of the two, or equal amounts of the four, or equal amounts of the eight, okay? Or equal amounts of the threes, you know, you're breaking it up equally. Now, a blend is when you're mixing fibers at the fiber stage. So when long and short fibers are blended, the longer fibers gravitate towards the middle of the yarn and the shorter ones tend to come to the outside. So the inside fiber is made up of strength and flexibility where the outside fibers are the hand, the peeling, abrasion resistance, softness on all of those properties. When blending at the roving stage, the fiber is not uniform. It's less desirable. The roving stage is after you have carded fibers. So roving is once you've taken a big old, just imagine a bag of fibers, you're going to comb them. I mean, so you're going to brush them. You're going to card them. Okay, so you're not going to comb them yet. You're just going to take them and you're going to brush them. So a big old bunch of matted, crazy fibers. Let me brush them. Let me get them a little bit more uniform. Okay, so roving happens after the carding. After they lie roughly parallel in smooth bundles, these are drawn out by hand or by machine and they're slightly twisted to form length suitable for spinning. So roving is carded fibers, they have not been combed yet, and they're essentially these, if you look up here at these images here, these are all examples of roving. Fibers that are sitting fairly parallel, they're pretty, you know, they're pretty clean, they're not perfect, they haven't been combed yet, but they have been twisted so that they can be prepared for spinning. You would not take a, a group of fibers to the roving stage if you were going to comb them. You would not spin them yet. You would take that carded fiber and then you would comb it before spinning it. So roving is always a little bulky. We say when blended at the roving stage, the fiber is not uniform and it's less desirable because when you're taking these two bundles of roving and you're spinning them together, it's not going to lay really uniform. If you blend them at the very beginning before you even card them, it will become more uniform. So I like to think of a blend as a smoothie. I like to think of you put your, your, your banana and you put your strawberry into the blender and you make yourself a smoothie. That smoothie, it's hard. Once you're looking at it in your cup with your straw, it's really hard to determine which piece is banana and which piece is strawberry because it's been completely blended together. It just looks like smoothie. That's the same idea here with a blended yarn. When you're mixing, let's say, alpaca and, and wool and maybe a little bit of acrylic, when you blend it before you cart it, when you blend it at fiber stage, then it becomes this just, just mash of fibers very uniform then they get row you know you, you twist it to make it into roving and thus then you blend it then you i'm sorry then you spin it into a yarn it's going to be very uniform so that's why it's saying that when you do it at the roving stage it's less desirable because it's going to be you know um more like a red vine more like a twizzler it's no longer um taking them and putting them into the blender together it's a little bit more like taking oh i don't know um, oh man, I don't know. Just, you know, taking a banana and putting strawberry on top of it. You're going to be able to determine, you're going to be able to distinguish between the banana and the strawberry. Um, you can see them, they're, you know, put it, 
put together at a separate stage. So it's less desirable, easier to, you know, distinguish between the two. Now, blend is when it comes to the yarn. And again, think about taking your banana, taking your strawberry, blending it at the very beginning when it's in fiber stage before you do anything to the yarn or making it into a yarn at all. That's a blend. A mixture is when it's yarns that are mixed together to make a fabric. So a mixture is fabric composed of two or more different types of yarns. Also referred to as a combination fabric. So you might see mixture or you might see combination. Both of those mean the same thing. It means that this fabric is made up of different stuff. It means it's made up of different yarns, okay? Maybe different yarn types or maybe just different fiber types within those yarns. So different fiber types in the warp and different fiber type in the weft. So again, when you do your assignment, when you say you take swatch number one, which is denim, so it looks something like this, you are going to take either this yarn here that runs down the side, so from top to bottom. If you take this one out here, it's going to be blue, let's say. Actually, in reality, uh, when you guys pull it, it's probably going to be actually the white yarn. But let's say you pull this one right here. This one's blue, so we'll call it blue. So you pull out this denim yarn, and this happens to be the blue one. That can be made out of 100% cotton. You could then pull out this white one, and oh, that's made out of 100% polyester. Or maybe it's made out of 98% cotton and 2% spandex, whatever that may be. This is saying that when you have a different, this is again the weft on the side and the filling or the, I'm sorry, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm saying that backwards. This is the warp on the side. I'm so sorry. Disregard what I just said. These are the warp yarns, and I'm sorry, we'll get into more detail on this um, in the next chapter, and I'm looking ahead. So I'm not saying the correct words, but these are my warp yarns, and then these ones are my weft yarns, also known as my filling yarns. Um, I'll talk about cheats and remembering which is which, but again, if you were to pull the warp yarn from this piece right here and it's blue, that may be made out of cotton, or if I pull out this beige one here, which is my filling or my weft yarn, maybe that one's made out of 100% polyester. So this is called a mixture or a combination. Allows certain color and design effects, lowers the cost of certain fabrics, and adds strength to a weak yarn. So again, this is when you mix yarns in fabric. Okay, specialty types of yarn are textured yarns. This is a process that we use for yarns that have the ability to be melted. So this is what we use for thermoplastic yarns. So a textured yarn is a, is a multi-filament. It could also be a monofilament technically, but it's a filament, a multi-filament yarn that are smooth, lustrous, and flat. And then we can make them crimped and dull and soft. We can do different things to them. So again, filament yarns just tend to be round tubes. They tend to be like uh, little, extremely small, miniature um, extension cord, you know, types of shapes. Sometimes they're hollow, sometimes they're, they're um, solid. But think of that long plastic tube Again, these are teeny, 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 tiny long plastic tubes. But that's how they typically come out of the spinneret. That's not always desirable in fabric. It's not always desirable in yarn um, and then fabric. It's just not desirable in the end product. So we can do things to it like crimp it or twist it or smoosh it. We can do all these things to it to give it new shape, to give it crimp, to give it bulk because of their thermoplastic nature. So because they have the ability to be created via that melting method, because it's able to go through the spinneret in its liquid state and then harden and become solid, because it has that ability just naturally, because it's manufactured, we can, we can alter it and we can alter it to our specifications. Yarn is shaped, heated to near melting point, and then cooled. And then you get something like this. So there's an example of it right here. It comes into the machine. It's flat and circular. It looks like an extension cord. It's a nice tube. And then the machine twists it really, 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 really tight and heats it up at the same time. Then it goes and goes through the cooling chamber. And when it's let go and released, it becomes this really kind of kinky, curly, textured yarn which would be great to give something a little bit of bulk, to give it more warmth, you know? Favorable properties of textured yarns, it gives them high stretch, high bulk, greater cover than a regular filament, greater breathability because now there's a bunch of air pockets and a bunch of room for air to move in and out. Better absorption because now there's all these pockets where water can come in or, you know, soap can come in, but stains can also come in. 
greater insulation, more warmth that takes up more space, softer and drier hand, more wrinkle resistant than spun or regular filament yarns, so on and so forth. So doing this process of texturizing your filament yarns has a bunch of different qualities that we can impose on that yarn that didn't have it before. There are some unfavorable properties though. One of the biggest things is that they tend to snag. So because we have all of these, ooh, all these little, you know, crazy little, you know, fibers and yarns popping up on the surface, they're more easy to snag. You know, fingernails, zipper, um, anything like that. Um, which is again, more susceptible to the snagging process, which is then can lead to holes, which can lead to, you know, tears, which can lead to pills and all those problems. Possible growth is a problem. Growth is not a desirable thing when we talk about yarns or fibers or fabric or anything. Growth is not a good thing. It means that the fabric is stretching out and not bouncing back to its original state. So again, if you think of something like this, like, oh, a rounded crimped effect. Ooh, it has these like pretty meanders in it, these pretty curves in it. But if you start to wear this and pull on it and give it a little bit of stretch, it's going to start to lose that crimped effect and it's going to grow. And essentially that means it's going to get saggy in a, in a not good way. Okay? We don't like that. Poor abrasion resistance because, oh man, we've already done all this crazy, you know, um, you know zigzagging to it or crimping to it. It makes it not as strong and more uh, susceptible to abrasion in certain areas like these soft points here. And easy soil penetration. Yes, it's giving you more air and more uh, more breathability, but it's also allowing you to get all these areas where soil can get in and has a hard time getting out. Okay, this came directly from the book. There's a chart in the book that shows you a ton of different um, textured yarns. Those textured yarns are very typical in for novelty yarns. So novelty yarns are oftentimes textured. So that's something that you might want to think about. Like, oh, you know what? Novelty yarns tend to have curls to them. Oh, a lot of them are, you know, rounded or crimped, or they have this, you know, peaked crimped effect to it. So again, tendency to snag, growth problems, not very abrasion resistant, and easy soil penetration. So not ideal for everyday clothing, especially when it comes to children's wear or you know, athletic wear, anything like that. Um, categories of textured yarns, we break them down into stretch textured and bulk textured. This essentially is just saying that when we are texturizing these multi-filaments, um, we can make them extra stretchy, and those are used for things like leotard, ski pants, hosiery. Um, again, very, very, very stretchy garments or items that we need. Uh, bulk texture is another way of texturizing, and this is a way of giving it more bulk. High bulk, low stretch, something like carpeting, um, something where you want the fabric to be very, very dense and big and thick and bulky. Um, there's again, uh, I don't believe it's page 73 in the new text, I believe it's 71, um, but it's, you know, it's in chapter 4, figure 1, so 4.1. Um, and you can look at the different methods for producing textured yarns. But again, one of the main reasons why we apply texture to yarn is for stretch and for bulk. We want it to be thicker or we want it to be stretchier. Um, stretch yarns are broken up into two categories. Stretch yarns can be either power stretch or comfort stretch. It, they are what they sound like. Power stretch means for holding power. Something like foundation garments like Spanx, swimwear, surgical support garments. Um, you know, when you think about, like I said, Spanx, those have a crazy amount of stretch built into them. That's not natural. Let's say, you know, Spanx are made out of spandex and polyester. Spandex and polyester can be a pair of trousers that you own. And those trousers do not feel the same that your Spanx do. And the reason for that is because the material used to make the Spanx was made from a stretch yarn, and it was a power stretch yarn. Meant that that yarn is going to have the ability to stretch and to hold really strong. So again, foundation garments, um, you know, um, compression pants, compression shorts, um, surgical support garments. Those type of garments are going to utilize that power stretch. Something like your, your pajamas, something like, you know, even like a, um, a little girl swimsuit. That's just comfort stretch. It's not meant to hold your body in. It's not meant to, to shape the figure. It's not meant to, you know, support a sprained knee. It's just meant to move with the body. So some yarns can be made stretchier for comfort. Some can be made stretchier for strength. Unrecovered stretch in fabric is called growth. We talked about that. That's not a good thing. Growth is not 
desirable when it comes to fabric or yarns. Again, you can look up that um, table for review. High bulk yarns, the most common yarn that you can probably think about in your head right now, or even when we started this chapter, you probably instantly went to the yarn rack at Joanne or Walmart or wherever it is where they have knitting supplies. And you probably instantly think of that ball of yarn. Well, that ball of yarn is not the type of yarn that you're going to be pulling out of your swatch kit when you do your homework assignment this week. That ball of yarn is much different. It's much thicker. That is a prime example of what we call a high bulk yarn. Acrylic spun yarns are very commonly found at the fabric store. They're very commonly used for scarves and beanies and mittens and sweaters. And it's a very common yarn to use to hand knit made by blending acrylic yarns of high shrinkage and low shrinkage potential. When finished, yarns is treated with a boiling or steam. It's a boiling process or steaming process. The high shrinkage fibers contract and they force the other yarns to bloom. So because the high shrinkage ones kind of suck up, they force the others to kind of, you know, it's funny, the best example I have of this is those videos that my daughter loves to watch. She's only five. She loves to watch videos of people playing with slime. And when they take their hand and they squeeze the slime and obviously the slime compresses in, inside their palm, but then it explodes and blooms from the bottom and the top of their hand. So it's that idea of shrinkage and then blooming and it causes this fluffy, bulky yarn. One that is soft and luxurious in the hand. It does tend to peel easily. It are flammable because of those exposed fibers, but we make sweaters and blankets and essentially anything that's hand knitted is going to be made from a high bulk yarn. Think about a thick, thick, thick yarn. The yarns that you're pulling out of your fabrics today or, you know, this week or the next couple of weeks that you're going to be using for your swatch kit assignment, they're going to be almost hair like. They're going to be so thin. You're going to think, is this a yarn or is this a fiber? Those are, those are yarns. It's insane how small these yarns are made, you know, to make a fiber or make a fabric. These yarns are so small and yet they're made up of 10 fibers, five fibers. So when we think of yarn, we think of, oh yeah, you know, that typical yarn ball that I use when I sit on the couch and I make, when I crochet or when I knit, my grandma used to make me, you know, a sweater or whatever. That is not the average yarn. That is not the type of yarn that is used in mass production of fabrics or textiles but it's kind of what we think of. So we, we kind of naturally go to that high bulk yarn because we see it. Now novelty yarns, we talked about these already. They're not uniform thickness. They have deliberate irregularities on the surface. They are made to look fun. They have bumps and knots and curls, seeds and nubs and slubs and bouquet, a boucle spirals. They have ribbon, they have knots. They have all these things that are meant to be decorative. So decorative rather than functional and they tend to be expensive. You are adding in a bunch of stuff, essentially. It's gonna cost more. You're then also gonna go through more processes. You're gonna twist it heavy. You're gonna, you're gonna crimp it. You're gonna, you're gonna texture it. You're gonna do all these things to this yarn. Again, it's gonna get expensive, but it's all for the looks. Gives fabric, gives fabric an interesting decorative surface and effect. All for the looks of it. They're not durable especially to wear for abrasion or rubbing. They do not hold up well to abrasion or rubbing. Should be avoided in applications where durability and long wear is more important than beauty, interest, and service. Now you will have a question about novelty yarns and their use in children's wear. And then this is, you know, great to come back to these slides to think about it. Would they work well? Um, an example of a very popular novelty yarn that was used in the 80s. We do not use it as much anymore. We still do sell, um, this type of a yarn or this type of a fabric um, in regards to upholstery, but it's not as popular as it once was. But chenille, this is a type of a novelty yarn that is also the name for the fabric. It is soft, it's supple, it's very flexible. The fabric is woven to make this yarn. So the way that chenille is made is fabric is woven and then that fabric is cut up into strips in order to make a yarn. And then that yarn is then made to, into fabric. So it's kind of a, a, um, a lengthy method um, in order to make no, in order to make this um, yarn or fabric. Um, we use cotton, wool, rayon, and nylon. So different fibers can be used to make chenille yarn. Um, and again, the chenille yarn is this strange process of weaving fabric and then cutting up fabric in order to make the yarn. So it's kind of backwards. 
uh, very popular in the 80s for, and even before then, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, for couches, upholstered materials, sofas, um, soft. And one of the problems with it, though, is that once you, um, you know, sit on it a lot, a lot of abrasion, a lot of um, uh, rubbing, it does tend to flatten out those kind of fluffy fibers that are sitting on the surface and then it looks smashed so you know you might have an old couch that kind of has the shape of a person where the person was sitting because that's where the wear and tear happens um, metallic yarn this is another example of a novelty yarn um, strips of metallic fiber um, placed into yarn they're not strong it's very weak not abrasion resistance um, and it must be supported by one or more fine filaments mm. Lorex, Lorex is the trademark name for these metallic yarns. Um, so if you look at this, you know, example here of these leggings that are made out of this very shiny metallic yarn, um, it has to be supported with some other type of fine filament. Um, and it also has to be supported because the comfort level of these would not be very good. It would be very itchy. Okay, so metallic is an example of a novelty yarn. Okay, so we're on 36 right now, so they we're going to talk about the yarn numbering system. It's going to take us, I believe, to the end of the chapter. Let me just make sure. Yep. Yep, pretty much to the end of the chapter. The last um, slide is going to be on sewing thread. So like I said, most of this is made up of uh, yarns, and then we talk about sewing thread at the very end. Okay, the yarn numbering system or sizing system. Yarns are bought and sold by the pound because it would be incredibly hard to say, I want to buy a hundred yards or a hundred miles of that cotton Z twisted yarn. You know, it's, and I want to make sure that it's only an eighth of an inch in diameter. And I want it to be crimped. That would be so difficult for somebody to sell. To think about yarns in that way, to sell it by the feet or by the yard or by the mile, that is difficult. So yarns are bought and sold by the pound to make it easier. But we need to have some type of system to be able to to be able to connect the size of the yarn to this sales system, so the, 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 the way that we sell them. So yarn numbering systems are used to express a relationship between unit length and the weight, so the yards per pound, okay? I know this sounds a little bit confusing, but again, this is just a way for us to be able to distinguish the size of the yarn in comparison to the weight of it because yarns are sold via weight. Okay. Okay. There are two main numbering systems for yarn. There's what we call the denier system and the yarn count system. There is a third system which we call the tech system. This was developed in order to bring all the yarn numbering systems into one single system, but it didn't work. So now instead of having one system, the tech system, we now use the tech system for sewing thread, and we use the denier for filaments, and we use the yarn count for spun yarns. And I know that that is very confusing, but it's just the way that it works. <laughs> so I apologize, and I know that this part is kind of mind-boggling for a lot of people. So I give you, I've given you picture examples. I'm going to try to draw out some examples for you. Um, just go with me and think about it as slowly as you can. Denier. This is used for filaments. Now, if you look here at this picture down here, this is an example of the denier sizing system, the numbering system that we would use for denier, for filament yarns. What are these things called? These things are called nylons. So if you've ever worn a pair of nylon before, it's a very stretchy hosiery that it covers up your foot. It goes all the way up your, your shin, your knee, your thigh. It goes over your body, um, and they typically sit at your waist, your natural waist. Okay, so these are called nylons. Very, very stretchy, and they can be different thicknesses. So the opacity of your nylon can be different. These are made out of the, they're typically made out of the fiber nylon. So remember, nylon is a fiber. That fiber can be kept in its filament state, that long fiber, 
or it can be cut up into little pieces. But when we're talking about nylons to wear them, we're going to want to keep them long. So we're going to keep that nylon fiber straight out of the spinneret. We're going to keep it long. We're going to give it a slight twist to make it into a yarn. Then we're going to take that yarn and we're going to knit it. So for the sake of nylons, they are knit. So we're going to knit them into these hosiery, into this like leg shaped garment. If you look at this picture, these ones are very thin. You can almost not even see them. It almost looks like she's got bare legs. But this is a five denier. Okay, these nylons are a five. The yarn, nylon yarn is a five. These ones all the way over here that are completely opaque, you cannot see through them. You cannot see her leg anymore. It just looks like black fabric. Those are a 100 on this denier system. The thinner, more see-through, finer filament is a five where the thicker, heavier, opaque filament, lots and lots and lots, very, very thick, is a 100. We call this a direct system. It's simple. It's the simplest of all the systems. <laughs> it's called the direct system. A small number is, you know, um, so a heavier, thicker yarn are designated by a higher denier number, and a smaller number is a thinner, smaller yarn. Bigger number, bigger yarn, smaller number, smaller yarn direct system. Sheer hosiery, like the picture above, is a 5 or a 10 denier. Carpeting is a 2,000 denier because it's super thick. Now, this is going to look crazy to you right here, and I understand that, and I apologize, but if you were to see on a spec sheet for fabric that you are going to purchase, you may see this combination of numbers and again, if you understand this sizing system, it will make sense to you. So if you see 300-10-1-half-Z, that is telling you in this simple, simple, simple set of numbers that it's a 300 denier. So that tells me straight away that this is a pretty thick fabric. It's 300 denier, so it's not going to be see-through. It's going to be pretty thick. It's 300 in denier. Also lets me know that, ooh, that means that it's a filament fiber or a filament yarn made up of a filament fiber. So I know instantly that this number right here means that it is going to be a synthetic or it's going to be made out of silk. But 300 is really thick. So uh, silk is a really fine filament, so it's probably not made out of silk, so it's probably made out of some type of a synthetic. So I know that it's a 300 denier, meaning it's thick. With 10 filaments, so 10 filaments to make up the single yarn, so that 300, again, a thick yarn, is only made up of 10 filament fibers. So 10 filaments, 10 monos, 10 single filaments within that yarn that are twisted with just a half a twist per inch, okay, and a Z twist. That tells me, again, this small combination of numbers and letters tells me a lot about the yarn and thus what the fabric is going to look like okay i know mind-boggling doesn't make a lot of sense and this is the easier of the three systems to understand okay that's the denier the yarn count is a totally separate system and it is used for natural fibers or if you go back up here remember we use denier for filaments, and we use, yarn, we use the yarn count for spun. We can take manufactured fibers, and we can cut them into staple length, and we can spin them. So denier for filament, yarn count for spun, which essentially means that the yarn count can be used for any staple length fiber. Unfortunately, the yarn count is also an indirect system meaning that a heavier yarn is designated by a lower yarn number. So I know that that is very confusing and very hard to comprehend. And the system already is very confusing because it can, it can encapsulate any fiber because any fiber can be made into a staple and spun. So as an example of this indirect system, a 50 count spun yarn is twice as thick as a 100 count. And... To make it even harder, it differs by the fiber content. So we have a yarn count. Again, yarn count is the system of sizing as it relates to weight for all spun yarns. 
Spun yarns are always made out of staple fibers, and staple fibers can be made out of any, any, any fiber content. That means that within this system, based off of the different fiber contents, there are different yarn count systems. And I know that sounds incredibly confusing, and I apologize. But you do need to know this in order to understand the basics of textiles. So, another example down here. I have a 60 S yarn count, which is pretty small. And then I have this 10 S yarn count, and it's quite large. And again, it's because it is backwards. So it's an indirect system. Small is big and big is small. As crazy as that seems. Another horrible example here of this indirect system. I have a two ply yarn, eight size, and then I have a three, eight, still larger, and then I have a four ply, still considered an eight. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second. So I know, very confusing. So cottons, cottons get their own yarn count system. It's called the cotton count. Cottons and cotton blends have their own system within this yarn count system. It's still indirect, but it's for cottons and cotton blends only. Now when we say cotton blends, that means that anything can be blended with cotton in order to fall under this cotton count system. So if it contains cotton, it's going to be part of the cotton count. Now when you use the cotton count system for this yarn sizing, you're going to get two numbers. The first number is the yarn size. The second number is the amount of plies. So 50-30 means that it's a size 50 with three plies. Now on a scale, let's imagine from 0 to 100, a 50 would be right in the middle. Now let's break that down. Let's go a 0 to 50 on a size scale. So again, because this is an indirect system, if our cotton count system is based on a scale of 0 to 50 and 50 is the size that would mean that it would be the finest, skinniest, humanly possible cotton count yarn because bigger is smaller and smaller is bigger. And it would be made up of three plies. You would see this if you were to look at a spool of cotton thread or cotton yarn. You don't typically see it. You may see it on like a on a on a ball of yarn that's made out of cotton at the at the fabric store when you're gonna go to knit. Um, so if you see this, this number dash number, and if it's a cotton, that means it's a cotton count, which means that you could have a one dash three, meaning that the one is going to be a huge, really thick yarn made out of cotton or a cotton blend, and it's three plies. Okay? I know, confusing. Now wools, wools also get their own yarn count system. We call it the worsted count. Now we'll talk about worsted wools versus woolens. Um, and in your book, you may have noticed that in your swatch kit, you, you saw maybe, oh, this is worsted wool. What does worsted wool mean? Oh, maybe you saw woolen. What does woolen mean? A worsted wool is a wool that has not only been combed, so they took a brush to it. I'm sorry, carded, they took a brush to it. But it also, almost, it also has been combed. So you take a comb to it. So worsted wools are the first brush, you take a brush, kind of clean it up a little bit, then you comb it so they're carded and combed so that it's a, a smoother, uh, more uniform, thinner wool material. That is different than a woolen. A woolen is a type of wool that has only gone through the brushing. It's only been carded. And the reason for that is because you want it to be soft and lofty and fluffy. So when it comes to this worsted count for wools, it is only for worsted, worsted blends, and acrylic. Even though acrylic is not made from wool, it's that manufactured wool substitute, it still falls into this worsted count category. It also is two numbers, but it's a reversed order from the cotton count. So the number at the beginning is the number of plies, and then the second number is the size. So if you see something that says 240, that means that it's two plies of a size 40 yarn, which again, on a scale of zero or one to 50, that would mean that it would be a very fine yarn via this indirect system. Woolens and woolen blends referred to are referred to as runs. So woolens are those thicker, heavier, lofty. 
wool yarns, they don't fall into this worsted count because they're not worsted. They are wool and they are, they are, they are, they are different. They're almost the opposite of a worsted. They're fluffier, they're thicker, so we call them a run. So they are rarely plied and they're usually singles because the more that you, if you start to, you know, twist and, um, you know, blend these woolens and you put multiple layers in, if you start to ply it, you're going to start to get rid of that pretty fluffy loftiness that's happening just naturally in that woolen yarn. So they're usually singles, never plied, not rarely plied, I should say. Um, and it's because we want to keep that fluffiness to them. Okay, this is very confusing and I don't expect you to understand this at all, but it's an example of what we call equivalence. So, 40-2 in relation to cotton means that it is a size 40 yarn with two plies. That is equal to two size 40 yarns with a single ply. I know that that's crazy. Again, that keep taking that same number, that 40-2 of a size 40 with two plies, that thickness is the same as a size 20 with a single ply. Because again, it's an indirect system, so it's the same. Keeping this same thing in mind, 50-2 is equal to a 25-1 and a 45-3 is equal to 15-1. And again, it's because it's indirect, so it is the opposite. So if you were to take a single ply of 15 and do three of them, it would equal 40. Does it make sense? Um, I know that it's very confusing. These are all equivalencies. So again, the 15 is actually the bigger. The 45 is actually the smaller. So that one single ply of a 15 is equal to, if you were to take three plies of 45 and roll them and you know, spin them together, they would be the same size. I know that's very confusing. So if you look, these are all very similar in their sizes. You know, these yarns are not, one of them, is, this one I guess would be the bigger um, of all of them. The largest would be the alpaca silk or, let's see, uh, would be the wool, I'm sorry, the 4-8 wool. So this 4-8 wool is definitely the biggest. So that means that it's four plies with an uh, eight size. Because remember, wool is backwards from cotton. Or if I go up here and I see that this one, this 8-4 cotton, this is a size 8 cotton with four plies. So, you know, these should be, you know, similar in size or similar in their, you know, in the idea because they're both four plies. This is just a size 8 cotton and this is a size 8 wool. Now, if you think about this alpaca, oh, well, let's go to this wool silk. Let's do that one in six since it's a wool silk. So this wool here, it's a two ply and a size 18. So it's thinner than this eight, and it's only made up of two plies. Okay, so hopefully that's kind of helping. Um, what you need to know is that denier, sorry, I'm going to go real fast. Denier is for filaments, and it's direct. Yarn count is for all spun, and it's indirect. Okay, that's what you need to know. All the rest of this is crazy. The tech system, again, this was intended to replace all the existing counts. It was supposed to take denier and yarn count, and it was supposed to make them into a single system, the tech system. However, it didn't work out, and now it's been adopted for sewing threads. It is a direct system, so it's easier than yarn count. Thank goodness it's direct. So heavier, thicker yarns have a higher tech number. Now sewing threads. Sewing threads are specifically engineered to pass through the sewing machine rapidly. So the whole purpose of a sewing thread is so that it can move easily through a sewing machine. They're primarily made out of cotton, nylon, polyester, and rayon. Cotton covered polyester is what we call a core spun, meaning that the core of the thread itself is made of polyester. We talked about, you know, the longer ones go towards the center. The shorter ones go towards the exterior. So that's core spun, meaning core of polyester, spun cotton on the exterior. This is the most commonly used type of sewing thread on the market. We like the properties of cotton and polyester blended together. And when we're mass producing clothing and when we're mass producing anything made out of textiles, it's nice to be able to utilize a little bit of natural and a little bit of synthetic for whatever fabric we're sewing. Um, the end use dictates the thread choice, so if you're making something out of 100% cotton, you might just want to use 100% sewing thread. If you're making something out of 100% polyester, 
you might want to use 100% polyester sewing thread. It just depends on the end use. Sewing threads may be spun, they can be filament, or they can be coarse spun, like I mentioned above. The cotton polyester is a coarse spun, a very common coarse spun thread. Okay? All sewing threads are plied. Always, always, always. And the reason for that is because when you ply a yarn, it gives it strength. And we definitely need strength when it comes to running a thread through a sewing machine into clothing or into a garment or into an item and then having it hold up. Sewing thread is what holds something you know, made out of fabric together. If it's not for a strong thread, then the whole thing will fall apart. So all sewing threads are plied. Okay? Okay. I know that that was an incredibly long chapter. This is going to get more confusing. Um, I will warn you that the next exam is probably the hardest of the exams. Um, it's going to cover chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7. Um, chapter 4 is probably the most difficult of those. So again, take your time with this video. If you have to watch it over a couple of days, please do. Um, and make sure to complete the homework assignments um, for the swatch kit and the study guide questions for chapter four. Okay, thank you all.